Welcome to another episode of Conversations. Today we have Claire. Welcome, Claire. I'm so happy to have you here today. Hello. Thank you for having me. Of course. This is a topic I haven't hit on yet, and it's I don't know why I needed to. This has yeah. been a long time coming. So Claire, I want to make sure I get it right. Claire is an anger management coach. I so am, she's yes. going to help us with our anger issues today. Um, I I wrote down what what it said. Um, do you help people calm their emotions so they can communicate effectively and have better personal and work relationships? Absolutely. That's yeah. phenomenal. I think everybody needs it. Uh, so my first question that I was thinking of this morning. So when you're helping somebody, do you go, do you go back like how a psychiatrist, psychologist would and try and find it where it stems from, or do you just deal with them where they're at? So it's, so I use NLP. I don't know if you've heard of it. So that is neuro linguistic programming. That's my coaching um, method. And what that does is that allows you to look at how your brain is taking in information and how that then filters all of that information and then controls what you do with it. And that's very much what our brain is doing or what our emotions are very much in control of us. So what I do when someone comes to me and they may say, so I've been working with a lot of um, domestic abuse perpetrators and they would come to me and tell me what was going on. But there was always something behind that. So it's not necessarily that I dig for it. I just ask the questions and then sit there and go on the journey with the client whilst they are kind of untying all of the like the wool, all of the, the string in their, their head so I, I just help them to work it out, really. Wow. Are they coming to you voluntarily or are they made yeah. to come and see you? Oh, so okay. I was previously, I was working uh, for a charity that worked with domestic mm -hmm. abuse perpetrators. They were coming, they were being referred by the police, by social care. Um, some of them were volunteering because they were going through family courts and they wanted to see their children again. Um, okay. So the family court would say you have to to do the program. So they would. But so many people realize now that anger is taking a big part of their life. And that's nothing to be ashamed of because anger is an emotion. We all we all have it. Right. You know, nobody is better than anybody else when it comes to anger. We can all get a little bit riled about things. It's just how we we manage that. Yeah. And and that's all it boils down to is sometimes there is something so deep in our history that is still affecting us to this day and we don't even realize it. Yeah. How do you know if if you're normal? <laughs> Well, How do you know if the anger you have is normal or if it's like, you need to see somebody? How do you know? I think we all perhaps know how it makes us feel. Mm -hmm. If we, you know, um, and society tells us as well, I guess, doesn't it? Yeah. What's acceptable. So if we're assertive, that is a positive anger because sometimes we need to be assertive to get our point across or to stand up for ourselves. Otherwise, we might be being bullied. But when we're being physically hands-on or when we are gaslighting or being coercive, etc., we know deep down that that's wrong. But then I guess, having said that, there are certain cultures where that is their culture. Mm -hmm. You know, that I was talking to um, someone a few weeks ago and they said in their culture, they weren't allowed to be emotional. Well, not, not, not allowed, but they were told don't be emotional. So that was how they were brought up as children. Mm. So it's, I guess, what it's about is looking at the values and the beliefs that we've grown up with and to actually ask ourselves, are they my values and my beliefs or are those 
the values and the beliefs that my parents or my family gave me? And am I acting out what my parents have taught me, what my parents showed me? Am I being true to me? Hmm. That's what I think anyway. Right. Well, I think a lot of people do know what their triggers are. Like I know that I, it's not full blown road rage, but I know that when I get in the car, I, a different person is going to come out of my, of my body. If so many people say that. Yeah. And I don't know what it is. If it's just a a control thing, because you've got this vehicle and I'm not usually running late or anything like that, but it's just, I don't know that I road rage is definitely the thing that brings out the monster in me. So what do you do in an instant where, you know, it's your trigger. Do you get, do you have to psych yourself up before you get into the car? Do you do it while you're driving? What do you do? So uh, people always say to me, how do I stop the anger happening? What do I do to stop myself reacting? And, and my answer is whilst you, whilst we all want a really quick and easy solution, there isn't one really. What we need to do is we need to do a continuous behavior change. So when you get into your car door and you're thinking, I need to get wherever and I might be late or whatever, as soon as you've got into that car, you've put yourself back into that negative position and you're going to start repeating those patterns that you did the last time you got in the car and the last time someone cut you up, you might start, (laughs) I don't know, shouting, sounding your horn, doing whatever. But because that is kind of, your zone and that's what you're comfortable doing you it's it's your unconscious is behaving that way on your behalf and what we need to do is get out of those negative patterns and start putting in new patterns so even telling and it is a a case of telling your unconscious when I get in the car and I'm driving to I don't know my family I am going to enjoy the drive and I'm going to be courteous. I'm going to let three people out or I am going to play some really good music that I like and I'm going to listen to that music and I'm going to enjoy that. So you're telling your unconscious what you want it to do. Okay. And and you so you have to say it in a positive light. So you don't get into the car and say... I don't want to get angry because what your unconscious will hear is angry Okay. because it can't process that negative. Mm -hmm. But if you can say to yourself, to your unconscious, I want to arrive at my destination feeling happy, having enjoyed my ride, then you're telling it what you want. Is it kind of like fake it to make it? (laughs) <laughs> what I see I don't know what that means what does fake it to make it mean fake it to make it means um that you basically like you'd have the plastic grin oh, okay <laughs> you're uh, like <laughs> okay go ahead and cut in front of me have a good day you know like so, you do that even though you don't mean it or feel it you just do that almost no, exaggerate so it's not like that <laughs> <laughs> no because I definitely want you to feel it so I'm a real speed demon when I get in my car and I just I don't know why I just I think well I think it's my ADHD I get in the car I'm not like very very bad at at speeding you know not high speed but I'll go 10 miles over what I should be doing and I've got speeding tickets because of that right Um, you know so I'm it's, I'm it's my own stupid mistake And when I'm driving, I don't really know how I've got from A to B. I've just got there. And so yesterday I got in the car and I can't even remember where I was going now, but I just thought, right, we are sticking to the speed limit, Claire. We're going to enjoy (laughs) the drive. We are going to get there. We're going to take in what's happening around us. And I did. And you know, it was just, and it was an easier journey. And I told myself, this is what we're doing. 
So okay. it is a case of, but you have to continuously do it. it it's like, mm. say we need to lose some weight and we're going to go on a diet. Yeah. We're not just going to eat salad for a week and expect that weight to stay off, are we? Right, right. We've got to keep eating well. We've got to keep doing the exercise. And for us to keep that weight off, we need to keep doing that continuously. It's exactly the same with anger. Okay. I like that analogy. Yeah. Uh, okay. What if it's not, what if it's not you, Claire? Ah. What if it is the driver and you're the passenger? Because yes. when you say calm down to people, that doesn't ever go. So <laughs> funny you should say that. So I was a police officer. And when I used to do, um, we called it officer safety training. And they used to say to us, do not ever tell anybody to calm down. Because the reaction you're going to get is a very explosive one. Right. It puts it's a fire gonna... in you. Why oh, is that? Yeah. Who are you to tell me what to do? <laughs> and then suddenly this person's ablaze and you, you're dealing with 10 times the anger. Right. So, so, and this is what I teach when I'm doing my coaching as well is sometimes, and pe you, we, we quite often see this on social media, don't we, with where people are, are saying, who are you to tell me what I can say? And some people feel very entitled mm -hmm. of saying exactly what they want without any fear of consequence for how what they're going to say is going to land with somebody. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, and they'll, they, they will be very entitled in that. And, and that's wrong, really, because we need to be respectful of how we're putting our point across. So for me, and again, having worked with, the people who were uh, being perpetrators of abuse and, and they might say to me, well, she's done this. So I was just, you know, saying X, Y, and Z. Why should she be allowed to talk to me? It's not about winning battles. So when we're trying to have a conversation with somebody, we just need to work out what we want to say and how we can say that in a way that is already looking at the perspective of the other person. How are they going to take what I'm going to say? And if they're going to take it badly, I need to say it a different way. And, so, and, I, and I hear that, I hear that. But what that also does is, so if, say, for example, we're in a scenario where our partner and us, and we're at loggerheads and we're having a disagreement. If I am, um, so I'm feeling triggered, I want to get my point across and deep down inside, I'm thinking, right, I absolutely should say what I want to say. Mm -hmm. But if I do, I know that is going to escalate my partner. And I might know that my partner's anger is something I really don't want to be on the wrong side of. And whilst I'm not trying to pamper to their needs, I'm trying to protect myself. I'm trying to protect me from their anger. Mm -hmm. And also, I guess, them from the damage that their anger does, not only to them, but to me. Right. So what I would do is I would look at perhaps what they're saying and try and use reflection and perspective as what are they trying to say? And this is a whole thing around communication is we all communicate very, very differently because we are, you know, there's um, people who are auditory, there's people who are visual, there's people who are kinesthetic. So they take in information completely differently. So, we might say, so I might say something to you and you may com completely miss the point of what I'm saying, but we might continue in a conversation which starts to get a little bit uncomfortable because we're starting to trigger each other purely because what I've said, you have misunderstood it. And so it, that in itself causes problems. 
So it's about when we're having conversations, trying to look at not just the words that have been said, but how they've been said and the the whole persona of that person. How are they? What's their body language like? What's their eye contact like? Are they saying in a threatening manner? Mm -hmm. You know, and even asking them, you know, can you just explain what you mean by that? And again, not doing that in a way that is kind of looking like we're looking for an argument. Right. So it's, I don't know, what am I trying to say? It's looking at what we want to say or need to say, but looking at the 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 path of least resistance, I guess. Right. The resolution. You want to have some yes. resolution. So you have to figure yeah. out how you're going to say what you want to say so yeah. that you don't get a bad reaction. Absolutely. And that's, and that's if you know the person, which can be good or bad. Like exactly. I'm thinking of two different instances. Like if my mom came over and said, have you taken out the trash? I'd be like, oh no, I need to do that. But if my husband came home, <laughs> have you taken out the trash? I'd be like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Throwing it at him. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, it it is it's a matter of um what you hear. Everybody, you know, in your mood, if your mind, absolutely. if you're in a bad mood anyway, then you're gonna assume that whatever. But we're getting into a time where people are gonna be getting to the polling stations here in the states. Uh, and just politics is just insane. And yes. p- there's families that don't even talk to each other anymore because wow. of their political status. Oh, it was so bad before. And now you can just feel it brewing and bubbling Mm. and it's scary. And it's just, I think it's just, it's going to be a great um, tool for people to listen and learn how to handle their anger because it is very much about being right. Like this is my side, my side's black and your side's white and we're against each other. And yeah, and people can't see the other point of view. Yeah, it's absolutely ridiculous that, you know, we're fighting over this. We've just had um, the general elections here um, only a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And and we also just had um, some horrific, uh, an incident in Southport, which is just down the road from where I live. And um, a a, a chap went into a dance school and stabbed to death three young school, young school girls for no reason whatsoever. Oh my God. Nothing has come to light. And he stabbed the dance teacher as well. They were having a Taylor Swift dance party during the school holidays. But since then, so that happened, we then had what they call protests they didn't call them riots, but they were riots. Yeah. And and they happened in Southport originally. And so social media sent out a thing saying that the attacker was a Muslim lad. They named him. It wasn't a Muslim. It wasn't the person they named. Oh, my gosh. So throughout the country... This then went from a horrific attack of three young schoolgirls to all out protests, huge protests of um, just racists. Oh my gosh. Yeah. For and completely going away from the main thing that had happened that this awful right. incident had right. happened. Right, lives were lost, little yeah. kids' lives. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. And they were looting in the shops. They were smashing windows. They were stealing things. Mm. Um, and, it, and, it's, and they felt they were right. They felt they had justification to do that. And th- there's no justification for that but they were so angry and again, so entitled that I'm allowed to be this angry and you're going to have to deal with it. it. It's shocking. Yeah. 
So Claire, how are you supposed to deal with that? Because clearly they're not sending you in to talk to somebody when they're all nice and calm and rational, (laughs) like uh, being a police officer, an ex former police officer, especially like you are crowd control, trying to calm the situation. Mm. How in the world do you, how, how do you begin? So if I look back at my days in the police, so that was, so I joined the police in 1992. So and I gulp at the thought that that was over 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> we it won't talk about that. Year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, and I was one, well, I was one of about three police women mm-hmm. on my shift. And I was the only police woman at my particular police station on my shift. So I... And I was 20 when I joined the police. Oh, wow. You were a baby. Absolutely. And my son's 23 now. And I just think, oh, wow. I now know what my mum and dad went through. Right. Um, And I very, very quickly realised as a young police woman that I would be stupid if I tried to fight these men mountain. Mm-hmm. or even tell them that I was about to arrest them mm-hmm. when there was not another police officer in sight. And, you know, in the UK, we don't carry guns. We my, wow. we didn't even have batons when I first joined the police. We had what we call a truncheon. And my truncheon, so the female's truncheon, was about four or five inches long, and it was small enough to fit into a handbag. Wow. Exactly. And we were given handbags back in those days, which was ridiculous. Yeah, really. So so I really had my mouth and my brain as my defense. That was it. So if I was stood in front of a man mountain or if I was running towards a fight... I knew that I had to be very, very careful Mm -hmm. and I had to be able to either talk my way out of it or just talk my way to keep that person as calm as possible without saying keep calm. (laughs) (laughs) And, And quite often to use their friends or family or whoever was nearby to help me to do that. So that might be a case of of saying you need to tell him to shut up or he's going to get himself locked up. Mm -hmm. And quite often then the the mates would come in and be like, right, come on, she's being serious. Right. Obviously, when when you look at kind of the protests that were going on recently or the work that I did with um, the uh, perpetrators, you're not facing... I mean, I wouldn't go into those those uh, protests they would anybody that I would deal from that would be somebody who had to come and sit in an office Mm -hmm. with me Mm -hmm. on a face-to-face but still I had one who walked in and started shouting at me and saying you're calling me a monster and and I you know I think I'd said hello how are you Um, (laughs) but because he was used to working with professionals such as police probation social care who only saw him as this labelled monster, you're um, a, a, an abuser, you're this, you're that. He was expecting me to basically speak to him in the same manner that everybody else had. Mm-hmm. So he started screaming and shouting and because of my background that he didn't know and I never told anybody what my background was, I just sat and waited for him to burn himself out. And he did, because he wasn't getting any reaction from me. I wasn't running out the door. I stayed, I remained where I was, and I just sat and listened to him. And when he'd finished, I simply said to him, it sounded like you needed to get that off your chest. And like that, he came round, because he knew I'd listened. Right. And I just gave him that, opportunity to speak and and I always talk about this chat because we went from you're calling me a monster to um he passed his assessment to come onto the program for behavior change which I didn't think he would 
by week five, I had done a, an exercise with him and we had to go outside So he, because he was sobbing. And he oh. said, I have never, ever seen it from my ex-partner's perspective. I always thought it was her. And now I have just seen what I've done and I am I'm ashamed. Wow. I'm absolutely ashamed. So from session five through to session 12, he was like just eating everything up that I was telling him because he could see how that was helping. So he, he was, you know, we talked about childhood aces and how his behavior could affect his daughter. And, and again, the emotions came out of him that I don't want that. I don't want to hurt my daughter. Um. So we went from monster on session one right. to telling me everything on session 12 about the abuse and how he'd been. Oh my god! how he didn't want to be like that. Right. How rewarding to, to see that progression. I mean, that had to have felt good on your behalf too, just knowing Absolutely. you, you helped him from thinking he, that he was a monster himself or anybody else thinking that about him. Exactly. So and what are some techniques if somebody is like, freaking out they come home and they're just in a bad mood and everything's setting them off is it best just to walk away let them have some time or what do you do in that instance yeah so I think and I always give a personal account of what what happened to me once and I used to work about a 45 minute drive away from home and I got in the car and I could feel and I don't know why it was but I could feel this rage setting in and I was driving down the motorway nothing had happened I had a really really good day at work hmm. but I could just feel those triggers and I was driving home I only had my son at home but I knew that if I didn't sort this out my son was just gonna get horrible mum walking through the door so I got home I was aware of it I accepted it I'm not in a good mood. I don't know why I'm in a good mood, but I know I'm not. And I know I need to do something about this. And my son opened the front door. My dog came running out and it was lovely to see them. And I just said to him, Harry, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I'm feeling really grumpy. Um, I think I'm going to go and have a bath. And he was like, yeah, not a problem. And he went and made me a cup of tea. I sorted the bath out. And when I got out of the bath, he was cooking tea. <laughs> and, <laughs> but he don't, it was the right thing, thing for me to do to acknowledge. And I think that's the best thing that anybody can do is acknowledge it. Acknowledge that you're feeling triggered. You're not feeling your best self. Because if you can acknowledge that to yourself, that's your first step. That is your step to overcoming it. And and just be honest about it. Don't walk in in that grump, but walk in and say, I'm not sure what's wrong with me. I'm just not feeling myself right now. And and be that open. Why can't we be that open? Right. I think we I, see it know. as a weakness, you know, like to let a day yeah. get to you like that. It, or some people feel like they don't have time to just go have a bath and sort things out. They've got things to do, things to do, you know, and, and that can make them yeah. crabby thinking I never have time to myself. All, yeah. I'm always dealing with the kids or the job or the husband. Absolutely. Yeah. So well, I think if we think about the outcome, so if we think about what half an hour for mm -hmm. me, that was having a bath, right? For somebody else that could be taking the dog for a walk. Yeah. Doing something, and yet yeah, it's on their own. But it's clearly, it was clearly what I needed. Although I'd been at work all day, I just needed, I was at home, that's where I wanted to be. And and I wanted to be around my son, but I needed that to be when I was feeling right. Mm -hmm. And so I could do that. And then we had a lovely evening. We had tea together. And, and everything was fine because that crabbiness went. It was sorted. Mm -hmm. He'd made tea. Everything was fab. And <laughs> if we can do that just by simply owning it, and we're told all the time, own it. 
then if we can simply do that and we can accept that when our partner says, you know, I'm not feeling such and such, can I have half an hour? Because that's what we need to re-regulate ourselves. 15 minutes for our hormones to settle themselves down and then just 15 minutes to get your the old grey matter back in, in the right place. Yeah. And, and then it, we're re-regulated. If we don't do that, if we're not honest and we're not, we, you know, we don't own it, then we're going to have an argument. Yeah. We're going to end up slamming doors, not speaking, being yeah. silent, everybody being crabby and ruining everybody's evening. Right. Yeah. You're being proactive and you're not just yeah. doing it for you. You're doing it Absolutely. for the whole family or anybody that has to be exactly. around you. <laughs> exactly. And if it, if it is in an evening when we've got home, it might not be, it might be at any other time, it might be when we're at work. But that is what exactly what you've just said. We've got to think about everyone who's around us. Mm -hmm. And if it's around our children, we need to be aware that if we're being um, abusive or even being loud and verbal, that those children, our children are being victims of us. And we don't want that. No, no, because they remember it. It's getting, then they get Absolutely. triggered, you know hearing things slam and all that stuff. So what Absolutely. is it that I know you said you help people that are perpetrators and whatever, do you help the general public or yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. So you are good out there for anger management issues. Yeah. Anybody so, can reach out to you. Yeah. So the perpetrator work, that was when I worked for a charity. Okay. Um, so now I have set up the, my own business as an anger management coach, because I thought, you know what? Everybody needs a bit of this because I, I just, I loved the NLP. I loved seeing the change mm -hmm. that it could, it could make for people. So I got myself trained up as a NLP practitioner and an NLP coach. Um, and yeah, now anybody who is struggling with their emotions, you know, sometimes we don't know how to say things and, and, calming that storm is like a, a, at the start it's about calming, calming what's going on inside of us mm -hmm. so that we can communicate it and once we can communicate it everything just fits into place right so yeah I work with individuals businesses charities doing coaching do workshops all sorts of stuff whether well, people want really. Right. Well, I want you to tell people how they can find you. But before I do that, I want to ask you, how does Claire take care of Claire? How do you not <laughs> take all that on? It's it's funny because um I am very, very open. So, well, I am now. I had depression. Well, I still do. And I again have started to own that. And I put a post only two days ago on Facebook. Um and, and I'm going to show you, nobody else can see it, but this is my stupid hat or my happy hat, as I call it. It's my happy hat. It's got a smiley face on it and it looks stupid, but I don't oh, care. Oh, it's cute. I like it. <laughs> and, I, so, and I just don't care. So, um, and, and unfortunately, there'd been a, a tragic accident around the corner from us uh, the other day, and it really upset me. Mm. And and I felt really down. And so I knew that Claire wasn't feeling good. Yeah. I knew this was going to get me down. So again, I recognised it and I acknowledged it because that is important. I had to acknowledge it so that I'm giving it space then. And I literally came in here which is where I, I work in my front room. I put my happy hat on and I know I look stupid, <laughs> but I didn't, I honestly didn't care. My partner no. was laughing at me I, and I took a picture and I put it on Facebook <laughs> and I'm smiling in the picture and I look ridiculous. And I put a, a post on Facebook saying, in this picture, you think I look happy, but actually behind that smile, there's a lot going on. So that was a really good thing for me because that was a, a healing process mm -hmm. that I did what I needed to do for myself, but I also put it out there, which again is that healing mm -hmm. and it's an education for other people. 
because I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to talk about those things that might make people uncomfortable. But I want more people to turn up owning it, owning what's going on in life. Because the more that we can own what's going on in life, the more other people will start to talk about it. Right. And more other people will start to identify that that's what's going on in their life. Right. Yeah, and that's we can, wonderful. We can just educate. And I'm only one person and, and I'm absolutely obsessed with the starfish story at the moment um of one starfish at a time have you not heard of the starfish no, story no no can i tell you the starfish yes. story yes so and i'll try and get this right so i think it's a proverb or a, a story whatever but there is a young boy and he is walking along the shoreline and this shoreline goes on for miles and in front of him there are thousands of starfish that have been washed up um, from the ocean. And the young boy is picking up each starfish and he's throwing them in one by one, but there's thousands of them. And an, an older man walks up to him and he says, what are you doing? There's thousands of starfish and the sea's just going to throw them, you know, put them back out. You, you, you can't possibly help all of them you can't save them all and the boy turned around to him and said but I can save one starfish at a time oh that's beautiful and and I might have not said that story correctly but that for me is he's doing his bit and for me I just think if I can if we can all just save one starfish at a time if we can all do our bit then you know the world would be so much better. Yeah, it's better than doing nothing. Absolutely. Nothing at all. Yeah, that's I love that. Well, tell people how they can find you so that they can talk to you in your beautiful accent and get themselves <laughs> calmed down. <laughs> um, so they can find me. My website is um, www.angermanagementcoach.co.uk. They can find me on Facebook, um, just Claire Bradley. Um, I'll send you the links if you can put the links into the show okay. notes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, that was just beautiful. It just really was, and it's such a good message. I love that when that happens. Yeah. I love to get the message out there. Just help Fantastic. everybody, help people. Yeah. So yeah. I will send you my links. Yeah, that's and great. I'm also, if I can just add, I'm in a book collaboration, and the book is being launched on the 11th of October. Oh, okay. It's a collaboration of 30 neurodiverse women. And we are all, we all have a chapter and we all tell something that has happened in our, in our lives and how we have overcome that. Oh, Um, wonderful. Yes. And that's called Beyond the Ordinary, uh, Navigating the Neurodivergent and Creative Mind. Which What what classifies neurodivergent? I am so... Uh, oblivious to what that exactly so means. that is kind of your ADHD your ADD okay. your autism okay all of that there's okay. probably a lot more to it right but, right uh, I've heard I'm... the term I just wasn't sure what all it encompassed but yeah oh Claire this has been such an awesome talk you are Thank amazing you. I've loved it yeah it's great I can't wait to air it I think it's just such helpful advice I think we all need it at one point or another we all need it whether mm-hmm. we are on the receiving end or if we're the yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah but um no especially like I said with the election coming up and everything I just feel like anger it's it's scary it's really getting up there and it's frightening Absolutely, and, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I'll put everything in the show notes, but I will be in touch. Thank you you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.